Uh, looking over the questions on uh, page three. Really, these were all uh, Rolling Thunder, linebacker one, linebacker two. Um, Y'all did, uh, did fine on these. Any questions? Page three. Looking over somebody else's test, I missed marking one. Oh, wait, along. I got have a question left. Yeah, you bet. I got confused with the graduating class. Um, okay. I thought that was something that we did later on. That we still did. No, so graduated response, that, remember that kind of referred to. Okay, we'll bomb them a little bit and kind of see if they surrender, and then if that doesn't work, we'll bomb them a little bit more than that previous time. Um, and remember, that was kind of what we talked about. We bomb and then kind of pause, um, and it was ineffective because then either North Vietnamese or the uh, Viet Cong, they would rebuild those roads uh, kind of during those pauses. Yeah. What was the one where you just throw everything at them? So we kind of did that more in uh, linebacker two. Right. So um, no kind of big, I mean, general principle there is we call that mass. Um, so you kind of go after them with everything uh, you got. We're going to talk about that with uh, the Persian Gulf War uh, today as well. Um, but yeah, those kind of two opposite um, ideas there. Good question, though. Anything else? Page three. Okay, page four. Okay, again, some uh, some linebacker type questions. Um, the only one on this page that really uh, tripped up a few people was number 17. So, kind of differentiating here. Uh, a, B, and C were all true. D was not true. What is D actually describing instead of tactical airlift? Okay, so remember we differentiate in class. Strategic airlift is A, bringing things from, you know, either stateside United States or major bases outside of, uh, of Vietnam into Vietnam with large, big cargo aircraft. Uh, we're tactical airlift, we're talking more uh, smaller propeller-driven aircraft landing on dirt runways or air dropping supplies uh, or using helicopters uh, to that same end. Any other questions, page four? Okay, page five. <coughs> I think everybody did really well on this page. It's all pretty straightforward. Any questions, page five? <coughs> all right, page six. Any questions? All right, and then page seven. Any questions with the one question there? What were the extra credit? The extra credit questions, anybody know? Number one? Dan Dan um, Chu. Dan Dan Fu, yeah. Fu, yeah. Uh, so Dan Dan Fu, that was the one, the last French outpost in Vietnam. And then uh, number two? No. Robert McNamara. I'm give you credit for that. What? Well, everybody. We have a new tie for first place on the <laughs> exam. Um, it was Robert McNamara. So remember, uh, the video kind of talked about him, the whiz kid. So there's a bunch of former Air Force officers and analysts who went and worked for Ford after World War II. He's one of those really kind of, you know, brilliant corporate uh, corporate leader, uh, corporate mindset, um, very kind of numbers-driven guy. Uh, and that kind of was what led to our uh, policy of graduate response. Vietnam, you know, measuring number of bombs we're dropping. I, I thought about it, but would Robert D? Yeah. I double checked his middle name. It's not D. Oh, I thought that was okay. That's fine. What was so, the key to remembering with the end? Uh, there was a Billy Joel song. The 1980s, we didn't start the fire. And there's a line in there. Dien, Dien, Fu, Fall, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. That's the only line I know of the song. And then we didn't start the bombs. They were rolls of Very good. There's a PBS. You can find it on YouTube, but there's a PBS um, movie on Vietnam. Like, they have a special, and there's a whole video on just Dien, Dien, Fu, and it was awful. 
of the battle. That was awful. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. I'll need these back, so if you guys can pass them towards the middle. So, uh, reason we, we asked for these, or I need these back, is uh, this is the same curriculum, uh, almost mirrors the curriculum of officer training school, and we can't have questions and answers floating out there. So, thank you all very much. Okay, final will be a pretty similar format to this. So, um, again, stick to those uh, samples of behavior as you uh, as you prep for class and prep for the exam. So, okay, so before the exam, we talked about uh, a couple conflicts in the 1980s. I'm not going to ask you the names of the operations, but where, what kind of places were we talking about with those conflicts? Libya. Okay, Libya was one of them. Cuba. Cuba. Grenada. Cubans were there, though. Okay, so we kind of talked 1980s. Um, we're going to fast forward to 1990, 1991. Uh, still probably, yeah, before you're all born. But I was a young, young lad <laughs> playing with Ghostbusters and Ninja Turtles toys when Persian Gulf War kicked off. So, oh. Open the wrong slide. Don't worry, they're here. Oh. But uh, you know, as we talk about, um, primarily we're going to talk this week and next week about the Persian Gulf War. Uh, really want you to pay attention, um, kind of about like you know things that. We didn't do so well in Vietnam and kind of what we did differently uh, during the Persian Gulf War. So, for all you history buffs out there, anybody kind of know what, what events led to the Persian Gulf War? Who invaded Kuwait, right? Yep. yep. Who invaded Kuwait? Okay, so I'm just saying. Something didn't, to add? didn't they cut off, like, the oil supply to the, like, I don't know, like the oil trade there, so they were trying to take over that area because of that. Okay. Yep. There was a, there was a lot of dispute between uh, Iraq and Kuwait. Um, uh, Iraq accused Kuwait of slant drilling. Anybody know what that is? Okay. And basically, instead of drilling straight down, kind of drill diagonally into somebody else's. Uh, who's seen the there will be blood? It's kind of like saying I drink gula milkshake. Okay, yeah, anything else? Go watch the movie, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Okay, um, so, you know, why was Iraq so kind of, uh, you know, thirsty for oil or thirsty for money in approximately 1990 time frame? What had been going on with Iraq in the 1980s? Hmm? War. War, okay. Yes, with whom? Nope. Okay, not exactly. It's a country right next to Iraq. Iran. Three of the letters are the same. Yes, that's correct. So Iraq and Iran had had a long, long, bloody war. Um, really kind of awful war between those two countries. Um, and they were they were pulling out kind of old chemical weapons, mustard gas, things like that. Uh, it had been going on for about eight years. Um, so as uh, as our country is kind of quickly realizing, wars cost quite a bit of money. Uh, Iraq found themselves indebted to various nations around the world, uh, approximately eighty billion dollars, which is a pretty pretty hefty sum of money. Of that, uh, approximate eighty billion. $14 billion of that was owed to Kuwait. So uh, they weren't necessarily allies kind of in, you know, uh, the Iran-Iraq war. But, uh, uh, you know, Kuwait was lending Iraq money. Uh, and in turn, um, Iraq kind of thought that kind of made them quasi-allies. Uh, and additionally, with that, you know, Iraq kind of saw itself almost as like a protector of Kuwait in that, in that war kind of. Preventing you know Iran from looking to expand even into, uh, into Kuwait. So um, you know as a result of this debt, 
um, Saddam Hussein decided to invade uh, Kuwait. Um, the United States kind of really at the time didn't think Iraq was going to invade Kuwait for this money. Uh, we saw them building up forces on the Kuwaiti border, and we thought it was kind of just a show of force. And then, oops, what do you know? Saddam Hussein actually uh, went through with it. Uh, and you see the date up there on uh, 2 August 1990. So the uh, representatives between uh, Iraq and Kuwait did not resolve grievances uh, over oil pricing um, as well as the, uh, the repayment of debt. On that date, Iraq's president, Saddam Hussein, sent his armies to invade Kuwait. The small, defenseless country was no match for Iraq. The Iraqi troops crushed Kuwait uh, and brutalized its people. So, um, you know, uh, Kuwaiti military surrendered rather quickly uh, in this in this fight. There was a lot of uh, kind of, you know, just civilians kind of putting up some, some resistance. Um, and, you know, when they were captured, they were, uh, they were brutally tortured um, and murdered. So... Uh, U.S. response was one of two operational names we're going to talk about regarding kind of the broad Persian Gulf War. So, uh, Operation Desert. Oh. Okay, that's the that's the actual uh, invasion, if you will, us ousting them. Uh, anybody know the other one? Operation Desert Shield. Okay, so Desert Shield uh, is actually our build-up phase um, in the Persian Gulf War. So. Uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush immediately uh, placed a U.S. economic embargo against Iraq in the aftermath of uh, Iraq invading Kuwait. The United Nations Security Council quickly followed suit. And on August 7th, so five days later, after Saddam refused to remove his troops from Kuwait, President Bush ordered Operation Desert Shield to begin. And by the end of August, 28 August, President Bush had defined uh, the following uh, U.S. objectives in the Persian Gulf region. So first off, uh, he, ordered, he wanted the immediate, complete, and unconditional withdrawal of all Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, he wanted to restore Kuwait's legitimate government. Wanted to ensure the security and stability of Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf. In the, in the coming slides, we'll show you an app of just kind of how close uh, all these regions are um, over there, where you know, there was a lot of fear that Saddam could have just pushed a, just west of his border um, and gone into uh, some of the oil fields in Saudi Arabia. And lastly, we wanted to protect uh, citizens abroad. Oh, and actually, the Map I was talking to you about this slide. Keep that up. Okay, so you can kind of see the corner of uh, so this is the Persian Gulf down here, Kuwait immediately on the Persian Gulf. Uh, you can kind of see the Iraq borders here, Saudi Arabia is here. So during Desert Shield, we were building up along uh, the border there in Saudi Arabia, uh, preparing to. Uh, liberate Kuwait, um, but also as you can kind of see, that's that's the movement of ground forces. Uh, we'll talk more about you know where where our air forces went. Um, but basically, we're going to kind of cut off and surround Saddam's forces um, on the ground. Any questions so far with our objectives? Okay, so. U.S. Uh, military structure that would be responsible for this was uh, CENTCOM, that's U.S. Central Command. So basically, Central Command is in charge of all uh, American forces, uh, basically in the Middle East, North Africa, that portion of the world. And the Commander-in-Chief of all forces would be none other than Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf. That's a nickname that we're going to use. So that's uh, Storm and Norman up top. Uh, just passed away, I think, in the past year or two. And then um, CENTAF, that's basically uh, Central Command Air Forces, uh, was, was put under the command of uh, Lieutenant General Horner, uh, an Air Force general. Uh, and he became what we called the JFAC. Uh, JFAC refers to 
Joint Forces Air Component Commander. So, basically just the head dude in charge of the air war. That's kind of all you need to know that the JPAC is. So, um, this kind of, this structure where you have that, you know, that four-star general uh, in charge of kind of the overall war, and then he'll have uh, a couple of typically like three-star generals. He'll have one in charge of the ground war, another in charge of the air war, and another in charge of uh, the air war. That was kind of uh, kind of result. Remember we talked uh, Goldwater Nichols Act uh, as a result. Of, I'm drawing a blank. Basically, our operations in the uh, in the 1980s, uh, as well as kind of lessons learned from Vietnam, we need, realized we needed basically unit of command. One person in charge, um, and then kind of one person in charge, kind of collecting all the ground forces together. So ground forces, not only comprised of army forces, marine forces, uh, as well as other assets. Uh, one person to kind of tie all those air assets together. So not only air force aircraft, but uh, navy, marine aircraft, army aircraft as well. Okay, so within the first five days, uh, you see some of uh, some of the numbers up there. Uh, five fighter squadrons there uh, in the first five days. Uh, part of the 82nd Airborne Division, that's a light infantry uh, division out of North Carolina, uh, as well as uh, AWACS. So remember AWACS, big Boeing 707 aircraft we talked about in the aftermath of Vietnam, big aircraft with big revolving satellite dish on the top, uh, radar, not satellite dish. Um, it's not ordering cable, uh, but again, that radar on top just kind of give us that uh, those eyes in the sky, so we can kind of see what uh, what's coming at us. Uh, and eventually, we would have 25 fighter squadrons uh, that would deploy nonstop to the theater. So basically, within a month, um, 35 days, we had as many aircraft fighter aircraft in theater as Saddam had. Uh, uh, basically, between uh, Iraq. And then uh, additionally in late August, so remember this all kind of kicked off beginning of August, uh, President Bush signed an order authorizing members of the Air Force Reserves uh, and the Air National Guard to be called up for active duty. Uh, throughout the campaign, Air Force Reserve and National Guard members both uh, flew and maintained aircraft for both uh, airlift, strategic and tactical airlift, uh, fighter and reconnaissance operations, as well as tanker support. So... Kind of one of the uh, one of those uh, big moments in history when you know basically a large majority of the guard and the reserve were kind of called up onto uh, onto active orders and deployed. So um, kind of unique uh, add on to that. We also uh, called into uh, force the uh, Civil Air Reserve Fleet, and that's basically where we contract out through you know, Delta Airlines, United Airlines, whatever airline companies. Um, we basically contract out to say, hey, we need your help getting, uh, you know, people and supplies over to the theater. So, how many of y'all seen Jarhead? Okay, so you probably remember the beginning of Jarhead, they flew over like on, you know, a TWA flight, uh, uh, commercial commercial airline flight. So, uh, we still do that today from time to time, kind of getting people sometimes in and out of uh, theater operations. But um, this is kind of one of those uh, one of those times where we had significant numbers uh, coming into play. I don't think they were there. They were just there still in training. How do we get a mass of people over there? Like, do we have a lot of time just flying in mass and ship them over there? Like, how does it actually... So, there, the, we actually will use the commercial airliners. Um, or, you know, whether they're U.S. commercial airliners or foreign commercial airliners, we'll still contract those out. So, even, um, like, even if you have a big unit, uh, going just like on a training mission. So uh, like when we would be sending aircraft out to uh, Las Vegas for some war gaming some training out there, um, you know, if we were sending 200 personnel, uh, it was a lot cheaper than buying 200 airline tickets and having people scattered all over the place. It was a lot cheaper for the airports just to contract out, you know, a small airliner and put them all on there. So I actually came home from my deployment in the uh, Pacific on a commercial airliner, just me and Two hundred of my best friends from my unit coming home, uh, so it was, was kind of cool. 
Um, you know, usually there's extra open seats so you can stretch out things like that. Not in the case of those going over to uh, Persian Gulf though, they were kind of cramped in like sardines. Um, then we can also, you know, uh, you know, the Air Force also contract out through, uh, you know, cargo uh, companies like FedEx and um, UPS, you know, uh, companies like that that have uh, cargo capability to help us get all that in the But we also use, you know, ships as well. So stuff that doesn't need to get there immediately ASAP, um, we will uh, we will actually ship some stuff over through there as well. So. Good question. All right, so efforts by the U.S. Security Council to find a peaceful resolution uh, with Iraq proved futile uh, on the morning of 16 January. So remember, this buildup phase had been basically going on from the end of August of 1990 uh, through the beginning of January uh, 1991. Uh, U.N. Security Council basically gave an ultimatum to Saddam Hussein. You have 11 hours. Uh, to uh, withdraw your forces from Kuwait, or we will come in with force and eject you. Uh, basically, we waited 11 hours. We didn't even get a response from them, so we uh, we kicked off Operation uh, Desert Storm on the next day, 17 January. So on 17 January, coalition aircraft surgically bombed key Iraqi military targets, such as heavily fortified command and communication centers, missile launch sites, radar facilities, uh, and airports and runways. Additionally, Iraqi ground forces were under heavy day and night air attack from that day forward. Yes? Did uh, any other countries join the U.S.? Yes, so we had, uh, we had a number of uh, coalition countries. I, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, um, but uh, there was uh, even like uh, some of the Arab countries in the Middle East had some uh, allies there. So Egypt was uh, was one of our coalition allies in the region. A um, couple big European powers were our allies as well. Uh, Great Britain, uh, kind of our biggest ally, um, as well as uh, France actually uh, provided troops as well. So. Is Germany part of this alliance? Is Germany an ally to the coalition? I believe Germany was part of the coalition as well. A lot of uh, countries kind of sent, you know, hundred, couple hundred. Um, groups kind of support the mission, so I'll uh, I'll pull a list next week. But Germany couldn't have been too involved because the Berlin Wall didn't fall until ninety one, right? So if it was nineteen ninety when all this started, they still would have been Germany. yeah the real Germans. <laughs> yeah, they didn't. Mm. What happened in ninety one? Yeah. Wow, oh, it was yeah, so cold cool. war. That's a lesson. That's a lesson for another day. Um, but great, great care was taken that we were exclusively trying to target uh, military targets. Uh, within the first ten days, of the beginning of our offensive operations, air sorties reached the ten thousand sortie mark. Uh, the coalition's intensive air power operations had crippled or destroyed Iraq's nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons development programs, its air defenses, its offensive air and ballistic missile capability, and its internal state control mechanism. So basically, within ten days, we kind of brought them uh, brought them to their knees. But we're going to talk about next the uh, kind of Iraqi Iraqi capabilities. Um, I think when we kind of talk about Operation Desert Storm, it's kind of very easy to kind of note all of our successes um, due to our technological advances and just kind of our uh, sheer number of aircraft we used in our operations. Uh, but make no mistake, we were facing a uh, formidable opponent. So Iraq at the time um, should not be considered a featherweight military power. It was still kind of one of the middleweights or heavyweights in the world, if you want to use boxing terms. So uh, as of the time they invaded Kuwait, Iraq had the fourth largest army in the world. So trailing only behind what three countries? Could you think? U.S. China. Yep. So the only uh, countries with bigger armies were us, the USSR, and China. Uh, 
Uh, Iraq was kind of a heavily militarized country, so a large uh, portion of the population was actually um, part of the Iraqi uh, military structure. So they had a standing army of about one million regular troops, uh, with the country having a population only of 18 million, so roughly a population of I think uh, it was at California a few years back, about 18 million. So, um, but to kind of put that into perspective, that's 5.6% of the population. Um, that's about the number of Americans that were wearing the uniform during World War II. So, kind of you can think of, you know, most able bodied Americans served in World War II, uh, most men in military age who were physically able served. Um, that was just kind of the status quo in Iraq of. Uh, their army and military. So in addition to uh, the 1 million regular troops, the Iraqi army had about 5,700 tanks and around 3,700 artillery pieces. And they were combat experienced uh, from both their eight-year war with Iran uh, as well as um, kind of their own uh, fighting within their country, putting down uh, separatist populations, namely the Kurds. They kind of had skirmishes back and forth with the Kurds in northern Iraq um, kind of on and off for, uh, for a number of years. Uh, the Iraqi Air Force had around 750 uh, combat aircraft, so that's kind of we're talking fighters, bombers, those kinds of aircraft, as well as 200 support aircraft. It was the sixth largest air force in the world, um, and kind of what made them formidable was that they were kind of getting the latest uh, fighter aircraft from Russia. So at the time, the MiG-29 was kind of Russia's uh, most formidable uh, fighter aircraft, and they were selling them to Iraq. Additionally, these uh, these aircraft weren't you know isolated to a couple bases uh, in the country. They had 24 uh, main operating bases as well as uh, 30 dispersed airfields, uh, and many were equipped with uh, hardened aircraft shelters. So you know several feet thick concrete shelters that they were able to kind of you know quote unquote hide uh, these aircraft. Uh, and talking kind of regional powers, uh, Iraq had the largest military force in the Middle East, <laughs> larger than Israel, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait combined. So basically, you combined all of its neighbors minus Iran, uh, it was basically the strongest military power, uh, stronger than all of them combined. Any questions so far? Okay, uh, additionally, they had nuclear, biological, and chemical uh, programs, uh, they call those NBC, I know, really fancy name. Uh, and those threatened the entire region uh, with its aggressive research and development program, large production facilities, storage sites, and weapon systems capable of delivering those uh, NBC agents. So uh, I kind of put up here a, uh, a chart or map rather, um, kind of the main uh, launch areas where they could launch. Um, we call them Scud missiles. Basically, they're kind of regional ballistic missiles. So, you know, I talked about we talked about after Vietnam the intercontinental ballistic missile system, where we could reach out and touch anybody in the world uh, with these ballistic missiles. They didn't have that capability, but they certainly had the capability to kind of reach um, a number of U.S. allies in the Middle East. There, so any most of uh, most of Saudi Arabia, all of Jordan, Syria, and uh, and Israel. Um, and actually, they did launch any of these Scuds. Um, during uh, during the war, uh, we had the capability though to shoot uh, shoot them shoot them down. And they did uh, had the capability to produce their own uh, missile launchers. They weren't reliant on outside parties uh, with those. So, um, kind of Iraq's history of nuclear, biological, chemical weapon production is kind of a uh, kind of interesting. Like I said, during the Iran Iraq War, they used those weapons against Iran. Um, actually, in the 1980s, they were busy developing uh, nuclear weapons. Um, that was actually that capability was actually taken out by uh, by Israel. Anybody kind of seen heard about that story? Kind of a they kind of basically Israel led a basically kind of a secret mission, sending F-16s into Iraq and taking out their uh, nuclear research facility. Uh, I believe it was kind of mid 1980s. So 
they just kind of saw that as a threat to uh, their own security. So Israel kind of acted preemptively uh, with that. So, and then you know, again, kind of you know, we're looking at this, you know, 22 years after um, Operation Desert Storm. You know, kind of one of the big justifications the U.S. had for going back into Iraq was uh, the threat of the use of nuclear and biological uh, weapons. So. Okay, additionally, Iraq had a significant air defense threat. So air defenses, you know, what are we talking about air defenses? You know, what kind of weapons are we talking about? We, we kind of mentioned some of these when we were talking in uh, Vietnam. Surface air missiles. Okay, surface air missiles. Anything else? Kind of thinking more old school weaponry too. Okay, so uh, black guns, we typically call that uh, anti uh, aircraft artillery, triple A, uh, as well as number of small arms, you know, even, you know, for lower flying aircraft, uh, a high caliber machine gun from the ground uh, can be a significant uh, weapon. So at the time, uh, Iraq's air defense system was thought to be the best in the world, um, only second to that uh, within the uh, Soviet Union. So these uh, state-of-the-art air defenses were sophisticated and integrated nationwide. So when we're kind of talking integrated, we're talking that hey, you know, their uh, you know their radar sites are talking to each other, passing on information. Um, uh, as well as kind of overlapping fields of fire. So it's not like you can kind of take out a couple of uh, surface air missiles and, you know, boom, you have access to the country. Uh, you know, there was, uh, there was overlapping fields of fire so that, you know, if you took out some, uh, they still had a lot of redundancy built into the system. They also used computer data links to tie the system together. Uh, they were not only redundant, but also hardened for survivability. They had 10 different types of surface-to-air missiles, uh, totaling approximately 16,000 surface-to-air missiles. So anybody remember Linebacker 2? Roughly how many surface-to-air missiles were fired off? 1,200. Okay, 1,200. So we're talking, uh, I don't know, what is that, 150? Or, no, no. Percentage is terrible. More than tenfold the number North Vietnam had during... Uh, Operation Linebacker 2. Uh, they also had around 9,000 anti-aircraft artillery pieces uh, as well as thousands of small arms. So um, kind of a, a note for any that want to be intelligence officers maybe down the road in the Air Force, you learn all about different uh, different countries, not only about their aircraft, uh, but about the, their uh, surface-to-air missile capability. Uh, we plan whole operations around what kind of surface-to-air missile they have. Um, and the more kind of varied surface air missiles they have, the tougher that makes kind of those operations because um, you have to plan for not only do you have to send an aircraft that can evade that kind, but you have to send it in, uh, you know, maybe jamming aircraft that can jam the other types of uh, surface air missiles, all that kind of stuff. So, maintenance officers, I didn't have to worry about any of that. Uh, and just kind of give uh, give some framework here. At this time, uh, in, in uh, you know in the world's history, the United States basically was the only country with the capability to, um, I guess, if you would call this an integrated system, we were the only ones able at the time to disintegrate it, um, to kind of break it down um, and uh, and penetrate Iraqi air defenses. Um, you know, like I said. Probably not uh, on par with, uh, you know, had we gone after, you know, Moscow during the height uh, of the Cold War, but pretty much kind of any any Eastern Europe, Warsaw Pact countries um, throughout the Cold War, this is how integrated these, uh, these defenses were. Um, and uh, give uh, kind of more framework kind of back to the, uh, the Vietnam example, you know, we talked about, you know, they had more than tenfold the number of surface air missiles. Just uh, kind of talking the uh, capital city of Hanoi, North Vietnam, basically all of Iraq was about seven times um, as dense for those surface-to-air missiles. So um, pretty, uh, pretty scary stuff. Any questions so far? Okay, so next we're going to talk um, our objectives uh, and our basically our plan of attack. 
So we'll uh, we'll kind of broadly talk objectives, and then we'll kind of show you a nice uh, nice eye chart that kind of breaks it down uh, a little further. So uh, first objective, we wanted to isolate and incapacitate the Iraqi command structure. So we're going to kind of give a human body approach to uh, to our objectives here. So by uh, Isolating and incapacitating the Iraqi command structure, you can impose what we call strategic paralysis within the Iraqi command structure by striking the brains and the central nervous system of the government's uh, civil and military command structure. So kind of we're talking about brains, kind of talking about the Iraqi National Command Authority, uh, as well as the internal control system. So again, that's kind of basically military uh, military headquarters. So if that's the brains, you know, what do you think is the central nervous system, your nerves, carrying out all this information? Okay, very good. So take not only take out the command structure, uh, but also uh, the communication structure as well. In X, we were going to win air superiority. So obviously air superiority, freedom of the skies. Um, and this would enable coalition aircraft to strike targets uh, without serious opposition. This would also disrupt the Iraqi Air Force and air defense system in order to clear the way uh, to other vital targets. So, And you win air superiority not only by taking out uh, enemy aircraft, whether in the air or on the ground, but also taking out their system on the ground. Question? Okay. I'm using ESPN for this. Okay, next we're going to destroy the nuclear, biological, and chemical capability. Um, and again, you know, that may not have been directly tied to the objective of, you know, liberating Kuwait, uh, but it was for the sake of regional stability. Uh, to eliminate the current and future capability to produce weapons of mass destruction. Um, and we could do that in a, in a number of ways, um, not only taking out um, storage centers, uh, production centers, but also just some of their uh, research and development facilities, some of their scientific facilities where they were doing this research. Okay, fourth, we're going to eliminate Iraqi offensive military capability. So again, this would help contribute to uh, regional stability. It didn't mean we we're going to wipe out every single resource the Iraqi military had, because you know if you kind of wiped out a country, uh, you know that it maybe just been at war with its neighbor for a number of years. You know we could have left Iraq uh, overly vulnerable uh, to attack, maybe from uh, Iran uh, in the future. So again, we're kind of looking at their uh, their offensive military capability. So again, uh, destroying offensive aircraft of the Iraqi Air Force, uh, destroying the Republican Guards. Does anybody know who, what the Republican Guard was in Iraq? They were like some really special troops. Okay, very good. Uh, yep, his, his personal guard. Uh, I would kind of compare them in World War II terms to Hitler's SS, if you will. They were kind of the uh, the uh, inner kind of henchmen, um, but also kind of they were the most, uh, they were his best trained uh, army troops as well. So, um, and they were kind of the most diehard um, to the uh, the Ba'athist party, um, his political party that they control. Um, so we're going to, you know, definitely kind of take them out, uh, especially their armored units, their tank units, uh, as well as the, uh, the Scuds. Those were those uh, mobile, um, mobile launchers for some of those weapons of uh, mass destruction. And then uh, lastly, we're going to eject the Iraqi army from Kuwait. So again, kind of uh, kind of cutting the head off of the body, if you will, uh, cutting off the communications, and then kind of working, uh, working basically to isolate the, uh, the Iraqi military out in the field without any command and control, without defenses uh, from the air. The thought process is uh, you eliminate em enough of that support network uh, where fielded forces will just kind of throw their hands up and surrender, which we which we saw in uh, in huge numbers.
Okay, so we're going to kind of talk a quick uh, concept of operations. Uh, this is kind of how we were going to achieve achieve those objectives. Uh, mainly, we we're going to have high intense air attacks designed to overwhelm Iraqi defenders. Hmm, high intensity. What does that sound like the opposite of? Graduated response. Very good. So you never give the Iraqis time to recover, uh, rebuild, or reinforce. And it was thought that it would be best to strike key targets simultaneously. So at the same time, throughout Iraq, hit everywhere all at once. And in the process of these high-intensity air attacks, um, we we're going to target only military and military-related targets. So, you know, kind of our thought process was, you know, we are going to war with Saddam and Saddam's army not with the Iraqi people. We're going to use precision guided weapons for important hardened targets and in heavily populated areas for maximum efficiency and keeping civilian collateral damage to a minimum. Again, there were some civilian casualties just because of the nature of where, we, where they had some of their uh, uh, key military um, and government centers. Uh, however, we were going to use uh, precision guided weapons to the maximum extent possible. So we were not carpet bombing Iraqi cities, uh, you know, with World War II style tactics. We're going to keep co coalition casualties to a minimum. Um, obviously, you know, we never want to lose more uh, more troops than we need to. Um, so we were going to use uh, massive air attacks using stealth, uh, nighttime operations using kind of what we had uh, basically in our corner to our advantage uh, against their weaknesses. So kind of using our strengths, our uh, major U.S. strength was air power. Uh, Iraq kind of their, their strong suit was, again, their basically one million man army on the ground, so we were going to use our air power uh, to the maximum extent possible to basically soften up for that ground war um, so that we were not having, you know, tank on tank battles um, that largely when I, when and if we were required to have a ground invasion, uh, that it would basically be kind of just cleaning up, um, pushing the last of Saddam's forces out of the way. And just so you know, He's not filling up the camel with gas. There's a, there's a pouch or something on the camel. I had to take it to the vet for the first time. Yeah, donkey. Sorry, it's been a long week. All right, so any questions? Okay, next week we're going to talk um, kind of a kind of bigger picture of this, you know, the, the body model of, you know, us kind of going after Iraq. You know, we're going to talk about five concentric rings. Um, and how we pick our targets uh, and how, how effective we were there. So any questions? All right, have a good week. Uh, for the cats here, make sure you get your, uh, your bellies measured for the PFA. Um.